Okay, so welcome everybody to uh, the third in our series of webinars, following on from two very successful ones with a, a cardiologist and then a WM specialist. And today, which uh, marks the start of um, Mental Health Awareness Week, I'm really delighted to invite uh, Dr. Ian Jordan to uh, talk to us. Do Ian, uh, we met, some of us met Ian at uh, our last patient doctor summit in London a couple of years ago. And he's a consultant in psychological medicine uh, at the Oxford University Hospitals. Um, and he's going to uh, cover the mental health aspect, really, of living with cancer, um, the psychology of it, and, and hopefully give us some tips on what it's been like or how we can cope with, first of all, spending a year in lockdown and coming out the other end of it. And then about some of the concerns we may have, the mental health issues we may have uh, moving forward. So Ian, thank you so much for joining us this morning and uh, welcome and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much Bob and uh, thanks for inviting me back. This is this is going to be my third time uh, presenting for you guys I think. So um, I'm glad you found it helpful and I'm, I'm delighted to be back. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, make sure I've got the right one. And hopefully you should be able to see this uh, presentation. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I'm going to do, first of all, is, is talk for about 20 or 30 minutes just about some kind of general principles um, to try and ground us in a kind of a framework so that we you can kind of work things out from first principles rather than having to be um, figuring out different solutions for every different type of problem that comes along. And hopefully then that will... Uh, Bob's gonna gonna give me some questions afterwards that you guys have been asking, so hopefully that will ground those questions in a, a in a conceptual framework that you'll be able to draw on again in future. And I'm gonna because, because it's been such a stressful 15 months uh, for everybody uh, and especially for people with with chronic illness. Uh, I'm gonna look at it through the lens of generally kind of managing stress and just thinking also about mental well-being and those are concepts that dovetail nicely together when we think about the kind of underlying processes. So you, some of you who have been at my talks before may remember that always try and ground the, uh, the general principles of staying well and recovering from physical or mental ill health in, 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 a, in a series of pillars. So these are the pillars here, sleep, movement, nutrition, stress management, meaningful activity and community. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those mean. Uh, and we'll be focusing today on stress management uh, and, and anxiety, because I think anxiety and worry is a, is a big thing for uh, a lot of people. Um, and we were, I was just talking to Bob beforehand, particularly when you spend a lot of time waiting for results and worrying what's going to happen, uh, especially uh, if we haven't been in touch with our specialist as much as uh, as much as we would normally be so first of all just a word on stress so people tend to think people use the term stress colloquially to describe a feeling or an emotion medically we think of stress as something slightly different stress is something that happens to your body anytime there's any kind of change out there in the world your body responds to it um, and technically the definition of stress going way back to Hans Selye's research from almost 100 years ago is anything that pushes an organism out of homeostasis and what that means is anything that pushes you out of balance and so there are enormous number of things over the past year that have pushed us out of our normal routine and out of our normal balance uh, and that has an effect then on our body uh, and the way our normal physiology is and that's a useful way of kind of grounding that in a kind of physical response and thinking about what happens to our body and mind when we're pushed out of whack because we were evolved for a very different environment to the one we live in now. We live in a very strange and artificial world, and it's been much more strange and artificial over the last year. Um, and those pillars are an attempt to try and approximate uh, a world that is good for us, a world that we were adapted for. Um, we evolved for short bursts of stress. We're quite good at dealing with short bursts of stress but our, our physiology and our health goes out of whack when we're exposed to long periods of chronic stress. And, and the last 
15 months for many people has been a kind of a perfect experiment of what happens when we're exposed to long-standing stress. And chronic illness itself, of course, uh, is an example of that kind of long-standing stress. And so we need to find ways of, uh, of adapting to that and find useful ways of alleviating that corrosive effect that it has on our, on our bodies and minds. If we think about stress symptoms, which I think is what a lot of people describe when they talk about stress, this is what happens to your body when you're, when you're knocked out of homeostasis or out of balance. And a, a lot of people will recognize these as things that happen to them. Of course, there's a crossover with symptoms of various different chronic illnesses, so it can be difficult to tell what's what. But these are really important things to, to bear in mind because one of the important principles that we'll talk about is early recognition of symptoms. Um, because it's much easier to prevent something than it is to untangle it once it becomes kind of, once it hardens into a, into a syndrome like depression or an anxiety disorder, then the connections between all the different symptoms become harder to disentangle. So one of the things that is an important focus for people is to keep an eye on what your particular vulnerability is. So everybody's different. Uh, and everybody has different early warning signs. Different people have different vulnerable parts of their body um, or their mind or their behavior um, that are those first little inklings to keep in mind in both yourself and in your loved ones to, to just pop, to just stop early on and think to yourself, okay, I'm, you know, my sleep has gone off or, you know, I'm getting uh, abdominal distress or I'm getting headaches or um, I'm, I'm snappy and irritable with my partner. What could be going on? There's, there's a, a spectrum of different overlapping kind of syndromes that we talk about uh, when we think about stress and its effects on the body. So you've got the stress symptoms that we've just talked about in a, in a workplace con a context when those become uh, severe, we talk about burnout and that has an overlap with depression, which is the kind of, which is one of the chronic effects of stress on the, on the body and mind. Uh, and then we also think about um, stress related diseases, heart disease and so on. Uh, and those, these are all kind of overlapping concepts. They're not, because we, we tend to use language in medicine that gives the illusion that these are separate discrete entities, but actually they're kind of clusters of symptoms and they overlap with each other. And there often isn't a clear demarcation between different uh, presentations. But stress has serious effects. Uh, and we can think about different things that cause stress. So there are the kind of obvious things like overly demanding work or abusive relationships, trauma, we're much more aware of and talking about much more now, bereavement. One of the big things uh, that, that people will describe is daily hassles. So just those things that pile up um, in the background when we're trying to go through our day-to-day -day bills and taxes and getting kids to school and uh, getting to the doctor and so on. And of course, chronic illness itself brings with it a whole range of stresses and daily hassles that, that, that build up over time. We're less liable to think about other things that are stressful, which is the absence of things. So um, a, an absence of good nutrition or an unhealthy diet is stressful on your body. It causes physical and psychological symptoms. Um, a, the absence of movement, so a sedentary lifestyle is stressful. It's not always possible for people who are chronically unwell to, to get the type of thing that we would normally call exercise, but any kind of movement, um, even a small amount of movement has enormous downstream effects on depression and physical health. The lack of good quality sleep is incredibly stressful on your body. So sleep is, that, uh, is a very active period where your brain repairs all of the damage that was done during the day and clears away all the detritus. And of course, particularly relevant for, for some of us over the past year has been uh, loneliness. So we're, we're social animals. Uh, when we're talking to people and being around people, our brains are in a very different mode to when we're on our own and loneliness or isolation can be very stressful. And then the absence of meaningful activity. And one of the things that we'll focus on today is anxiety and overthinking and rumination. Rumination means getting stuck in that kind of tumble dryer type of thinking where your thoughts just go around and around. Uh, and I think many of us have kind of learned over the years implicitly that thinking is how you work out problems. Um, but actually our brains probably weren't 
evolved to just be idle and think and we're not very good at it we tend to get stuck in a kind of an emotional type of thinking and sometimes if the problem you're thinking about is a kind of a narrow technical problem um thinking is the way out of it but actually most of those problems that kind of come at us and where we think about and we're ruminating most of those get worked out while we're busy doing something else and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about a distinction between um thinking and doing uh and, and which of those is more nourishing uh, i think you're going to have a uh you're going to have a mindfulness session coming up soon i think bob uh and, and that's that's going to be rel very relevant to thinking about the difference between thinking or observing or doing so stress can be internal finally so we are very capable of producing our own stress just by kind of sitting there and worrying about things and i think that's uh has been a major problem for many people who have uh, medical conditions over the past year and so that's uh, very relevant to what i was just talking about and something that we'll touch on as well so pe people talk about stress as if it's a, a, an unalloyed bad but actually if you think about anything that pushes an organism out of homeostasis anything that knocks us out of balance um any any time you want to learn something new or get stronger or faster or perform better personally or professionally or indeed if you want to stay engaged with life stress short term stress is actually a necessary part of that so having absolutely no stress in your life um is almost as unhealthy as having too much stress and so there's a kind of a balance there between kind of pushing yourself a little bit and doing things that are enjoyable and nourishing and rewarding and going the other way and having a type of stress that is overwhelming and makes you sick and i think uh, last or two years ago i think we talked a little bit about this uh, graph this is called the yerk stutz and performance curve and a little bit of stress um makes us perform at our best um so if you've ever done a presentation and felt a bit nervous beforehand that's i heard a mother uh, describing it to her child recently as that's the engine revving up and getting you ready to perform at your best uh, anybody who's ever trained in the gym or done any kind of uh any kind of exercise or fitness will know that you have to tire yourself out and you have to kind of push yourself but we're more interested in the other end of the Uh, of the graph there the where stress becomes overwhelming you get a fatigue exhaustion ill health and breakdown so what are the different kind of strategies we can use to manage these stressful effects and i'm going to talk through five uh, of these uh, and i think that we will come back to these when when bob asks some questions um because uh this if if you think about these as your kind of moorings then no matter what you're facing you should be able to come back to one of these and say okay well this is the most relevant one here so the first one is cognitive strategy so somebody asked about um cbt as a uh as a treatment uh so so cbt is a psychological therapy or a talking therapy that is the most widely used um psychological therapy probably in the world certainly in the uk um so if you go to your gp and uh, your gp recommends talking therapy it will almost certainly be cbt and cbt is a theoretical framework it um dates back to the late 70s um and the idea is that you know over the course of the day your your sort of internal experience is a combination of thoughts that you have behaviors that you do and emotional experiences that come up and those are all tightly related it's a really good theory it's a very sound theory it's backed up by tens of thousands of of research papers showing its effectiveness the idea is that there's a helpful way and an unhelpful way to think um not a good way or a bad way because you know assigning value to those uh to those thoughts it can be counterproductive but instead there can be a helpful and untold a uh, helpful way of thinking and in terms of behavior there are some behaviors that tend us towards health and there are some behaviors that tend us towards ill health and then in terms of emotional experience there are different ways of thinking about emotional experience i think that the most helpful way of thinking about emotions is that there are things that arise in your body emotions are very embodied um and what cbt does is it draws lines between all of those things and says okay if we shift behavior a little bit here it'll have a downstream effect on thinking which will have a downstream effect on emotional experience and so on so just a couple of ideas in terms of cognitive strategies and so that means thinking strategies and um, the first is is mindset so uh one of the 
one of the ways in CBT that we think about um, mindset is, as I said, we think about helpful or unhelpful strategies. Sometimes it's helpful to have uh, like an automatic behavior that you put in place when you're thinking about something in a particular way. And so um, one of the more famous ones uh, that I find really helpful, that patients find really helpful, is this idea of growth mindset or opportunity mindset. And I've linked in, at the end of the talk to um, Carol Dweck's book, which is called Growth Mindset. So the idea is that when something comes along that it feels uh, overwhelming or when you get bad news or something else, um, it's often help helpful to have a, a little automatic thing that you do that you notice you're disappointed or feeling overwhelmed and you think to yourself okay where is the opportunity and what's just happened so when I work through this with patients they'll often come back and say for instance that they uh, got some bad news about their they'd applied for a job but they didn't get the job but then when they when they thought about their opportunity mindset they realized well actually that job wasn't the one i was really interested in and this is an opportunity for me to apply for one that i was more interested in or one that was closer to home and so on so even when something feels like it's terrible news it's often possible to just stop and say okay so that is bad news but what where's the opportunity here how can i use this disappointment to find something else that's better the second strategy that uh has been particularly useful over the past year and i've spoken to probably a hundred patients about this over the past year is this idea of can you do anything about it right now so when we're worrying and stressing and when things are rattling around in our head um, the very first step is to think to yourself okay is this something i can do uh, is this a problem that i can do something about right now if the answer is yes great get a piece of paper write down what you're going to do or write down a list of things that you can do if the answer is no well, then it's important to remember that you've no business worrying about it. If it's something that's outside your sphere of control, then worrying about it, the only thing that that will achieve is that kind of corrosive, erosive, physical consequence of stress. And so we'll talk later about how you'll shift from that thinking, from that kind of uh, ruminating about something that you can't control to doing something that's more uh, nourishing and healthy. And finally, some strategies that are specifically from CBT. Uh, the first is uh, reframing, which is similar to the kind of growth mindset idea, which is this uh, concept that when you look at a particular situation, you look at it through a particular frame, through a particular lens. And I call this um, shifting the camera angle, this idea that you can move the camera so that the situation looks a little bit different and people uh if people i've put a link at the end and people can explore this a little bit more and if anybody uh decides to go for cognitive therapy um then this is one of the things that they'll explore how can i look at this situation from a different angle where it doesn't seem so awful um and then the final technique that uh i've mentioned here from cbt is uh, exposure and this is particularly relevant to um anxiety uh particularly if it's uh fear or anxiety about a particular thing so that may be social anxiety or that may be um uh, any kind of a fear of a, of a particular situation or of a particular uh thought uh, and the the principle of exposure in cbt is based on this idea that most anxiety uh is a consequence of avoidance so we're first of all nervous about something then we avoid the situation that causes that anxiety and the the reason that that's a problem is because it's really effective so if uh if any of you think about uh, think back to a time maybe you were uh, supposed to go to some event and you were very anxious about going to the event so that nerves kind of building up beforehand you're feeling more and more apprehensive and as soon as you make the decision not to go you feel much much better you get this sort of flood of relief through your body um, so it's an extremely effective strategy for dealing with uh, nervousness apprehension and fear the problem is that the next time you go to do the thing you were nervous about it's more anxiety provoking and so you get this kind of vicious cycle of uh, fear anxiety avoidance and so one of the things when people do cbt is a thing called graded exposure where you will slowly over time expose yourself to uh, incrementally more um, difficult versions of the feared thought or the feared uh, situation uh, and it's an important principle if you try and spot when you're feeling anxious or fearful what am i avoiding and do i need to kind of go through with this and start to start to gently expose myself to this situation or this thought uh, 
Um, sometimes the, the anxiety provoking thing is a thought or a memory. Uh, and so uh, in PTSD or other trauma related presentations, sometimes you need to be coached to expose yourself to that kind of, to that thought. Uh, and that's what, that's at the more difficult end and often we need professional help with that. There are some things that are sort of antidotes to stress. Um, so stress is kind of inevitable. So we can't always reduce the thing that's stressful. We can't always completely get, keep it out of our mind and change the way we're thinking about it. But there are some things that are antidotes to this physiological, this physical response to stress. The first is, is exercise or movement of any kind. And exercise is incredibly effective at dulling down the, the uh, physiological effect of stress. So it, it, in a very real way, it's, it's an antidote to that. The second is connection. As I said before, you know, we're social animals. We were evolved to be around other people. When we're talking to other people, we, uh, the, our, the way that we think is very different to when we're just sitting alone. When we're, when we're around people, we're talking, we're having a dialogue and the brain is in a very different mode to when you're just sat on your own and kind of chewing over problems. And just physically being around other people dampens down our stress response as well. Nutrition is a really important thing to keep in mind because a healthy diet, and when, we, when I say healthy diet, it's not brain surgery, a healthy diet. Uh, we, we usually think of a Mediterranean diet, so lots of veg and fish. Um, and the reason that we talk so much about a Mediterranean diet is because it is anti-inflammatory. So it, it tends to reduce inflammation in the body where stress tends to increase inflammation in the body. So all of these things, all of these antidotes we're talking about dampen down that stress and inflammation response. So nutrition is an important one to keep in mind. And, and, and there, there are uh, an increasing numbers of randomized control trials. So sort of gold standard medical evidence that uh, nutrition is an effective treatment. Uh, so nutritional uh, interventions are an effective treatment, for instance, for certain types of depression. So um, if, if, if you think that nutrition may be off, then thinking about having lots of veg, having lots of fish, or um, adding in uh, omega-3 supplements, which are, are the oils found in fish. If you're a vegan, for instance, you can find vegan ones. Um, and that is an, a good way of thinking about a kind of a holistic way of thinking about not just physical well-being, but also mental well-being. And the final one is sleep. Um, sleep is, uh, as I said before, sleep is a very active period where your brain is repairing and cleaning house. Uh, and sleep should be top of our minds and something that we prioritize. Um, I think it tends to be something that we that's easy to kind of leave uh, at the bottom of the list because we have lots of stuff to do and we're busy doing other things. But sleep is a really important thing. Um, and if you are experiencing the very severe end of sleep problems, so we call it insomnia, which is severe sleep problems, which make you tired and uh, exhausted the next day, unable to function. Um, sometimes uh, that requires medical intervention. So uh, that, that's cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is an incredibly effective treatment uh, and will be available through your GP wherever you are in the country, um, either through a, a digital, uh, either through, sorry, it's not an app, it's a, a web-based digital uh, intervention or through your local uh, improving access to psychological therapies uh, service, which are available to everybody in the country. The next thing is to, to stay alert to those early warning signs. So it listed the physical symptoms of stress and anxiety uh, at the beginning of the presentation. And it's really important to stay alert to those. This is, this is one of those magic eye drawings. Uh, and it's, it's one of those things that until you first are able to see the, the hidden pattern, uh, it's invisible to you. Uh, and until you start to think about the, uh, your early warning signs or your loved one's early warning signs, they tend to be invisible. So I know myself that often the first, uh, the first time I notice that I'm feeling overwhelmed is when I'm irritable and snappy at home or at work, uh, or if I'm waking up early in the morning. Uh, and despite the fact that I'm supposed to be a psychiatrist, 
I don't notice in the weeks leading up to that. So I won't notice that uh, I'm take, I've taken on too much work or I won't notice that the work is too busy or stressful or I won't notice that I'm feeling tense and nervous and anxious and it's only when it starts to affect my behavior and it starts to affect my sleep that I notice. And that's the point where I start to row back and say, okay, I need to focus on my sleep. I need to start making sure I'm getting you know, a walk in at least every day. Uh, I need to make sure that I am eating better. I did notice after Christmas that, because I'm usually fastidious about my diet, but after Christmas, I went through a phase being very, very busy and overwhelmed at work where I was just shoving food into my mouth uh, to get through the day. And of course, that was probably having a downstream effect on fatigue and sleep and general physical stress symptoms. So those early warning signs are important. Keep an eye on those or get someone else to keep an eye on them for you um, if, if that's more helpful. Next thing to think about is habits. Um, I'll, I've linked to a book at the end of the presentation called um, Atomic Habits by James Clear, uh, because one of the things, when, particularly if, if you're not working and it's locked down and you're at home, uh, it can be extremely difficult to find the type of structure in your day that gives you that kind of sense of well-being, a sense of achievement, gives you a normal structure and sleep routine. Uh, and the reason for that is that in uh, Normally, if you're working, you've got stuff to do and you've got people to see and you have social connection at work, your your habits and your, your structure of your day is kind of done for you. And this is one of the reasons why unemployment is so devastating for people's mental health, which is because all of these pillars that we're talking about are kind of done for you uh, because you're at work and you have to commute and you have to get home and you have to do stuff. If those things aren't there, then we need to think much harder about building them in ourselves. Um, and James Clear's book is a really useful way of thinking about how to outsource all of that to habits rather than having to do it yourself. Because one of the one of the problems people get into when they're uh, when their day isn't structured and when they haven't built in habits is you spend a lot of time negotiating with yourself. You know, sort of. Uh, if I think back to um, a couple of years ago when I was trying to get into going to the gym, I would spend an inordinate amount of time sitting at home deciding when was the right time to go to the gym. Will I go in an hour? Will I go now? Maybe I'll go tomorrow. That would be better. And that decision making is exhausting. So you, you only have a limited amount of decision making capacity in a given day. Uh, and we get this thing called decision fatigue when we sit there negotiating with ourselves about what we're going to do. And this is a very familiar to, to people uh, in lockdown, particularly people who've been out of work or people who've been unwell, is that they have been kind of stuck in this kind of loop of negotiating with themselves, which is mentally exhausting, which leaves you with no cognitive reserve to then uh, go and do things that are enjoyable afterwards. So starting to build habits in is fundamentally important. Um, that means uh, habits for when you're feeling stressed. It means habits for structuring your day. It means scheduling in uh, enjoyable activity. It means scheduling in connection with people. So um, a lot of people have found it helpful to to diarize connection with people once or twice in any given day. They'll say, okay, at this time I have a 10 minute phone call while I'm going for a walk with this person. Um, and it means that you're, you don't spend all that time negotiating with, with yourself, tiring yourself out and stuck idle in a pattern of kind of overthinking and rumination, which some people are very, very prone to. Um, some people aren't and they can very happily sit around and daydream uh, and have a quite an enjoyable kind of time and it's relaxing. But most people, uh, when they're idle, their brain will go to that worried, stressed, chewing over rumination place. Uh, and so do, don't think is, is a good principle here. We are designed to be active and doing things. We're not designed to be sitting around thinking. So that's an important principle. Mindfulness is a useful structured way of doing this. Um, and mindfulness is really good. Generally speaking, mindfulness describes any activity that is or can describe any activity that isn't thinking. So you could be mindful while you're doing the dishes. If, you're fo if your focused attention is on the sensation of the warm water in your hands, mindfulness can be sitting and doing a breathing med meditation where your focus is on 
uh, physical sensations that are coming up. So physical sensation of breathing. So that's observing, not thinking. It can be in observing your thoughts coming and going. And that's the real skill of mindfulness is to be able to sit there while thoughts come and go without letting them get, get their claws into you uh, and without kind of getting stuck in a kind of anxious thinking pattern. So I always, I do, I think, I think mindfulness, it, there's probably too much emphasis on mindfulness in kind of general mental health at the moment, but it is a fundamentally uh, useful skill for dealing with everyday stresses and worries. Um, it's not the only skill and there's, you know, we're talking about some other ones here, but it is a really, really useful one. I think of mindfulness as being a little bit like a spanner in your toolbox. You couldn't do all your home repairs with just a spanner, but you also absolutely need a spanner in order, in order to do your home repairs. So it is really, really important, but it's not the only thing. Uh, and uh, if, if, uh, if people are interested, there are, there are loads of really good resources uh, online. So some of them are paid for, like Cam and Headspace are paid for versions. I think they're okay, um, but there are even better uh, free versions out there. So you can either go on YouTube and Google guided mindfulness, or you can download an app like uh, Mindfulness Coach, which is uh, comes from the States and it comes from the, uh, the, the VA hospitals in the States have released a free uh, Mindfulness Coach uh, app that you can get for Android or Apple devices. Um, and it's, it's perfectly good. One important thing about mindfulness is that it is a skill that you need to develop over a period of time. It can feel difficult and clumsy and annoying at first, um, but with, with time and with practice, it is a really, really valuable tool in your toolbox. So those things that we've talked about there, um, antidotes to stress, so those are sleep, exercise, nutrition, meaningful and enjoyable activity, uh, and we'll talk about that again uh, in a second. Know, know your early warning signs. So spot when you're getting crabby or when you're getting headaches or when you're, uh, when you're waking up early. Outsource all of this to habits rather than depending on yourself to do it. James Clear's website, which I've linked at the, at the end of the presentation, is a great place to start to get you thinking about um, uh, outsourcing all of this worry to habits. It's a little bit like the idea in if, if, you've, uh, if you've ever done any kind of productivity coaching or looked at um, organizational skills, or if you've ever thought about what to do when you're overthinking at bedtime, one, one of the really useful uh, things, that, uh, uh, strategies that you can learn is to, so for instance, if, if you're trying to get to sleep and your mind is full of all of these worries, if you get up, write them down on a piece of paper, then they're, they're done, you can look at them tomorrow, you can go back to sleep. And there's something about that, physically getting those ideas out of your head and onto a piece of paper that can be really useful. Um, number four is cognitive strategies. So I've linked to some ideas at the end of the presentation again, thinking about ways of shifting mindset and having an automatic kind of mental behavior when something comes along. Now, whether that's thinking, okay, can I actually do anything about this right now? And if the answer is no, okay, I have no business worrying about it. I'm gonna do something instead of thinking. Uh, and, the, and the second is uh, growth or opportunity mindset to thinking, okay, this has happened. I can't do anything about that now. How can I turn this into my advantage or how can I use this disappointment as fuel to do something else? And finally, strategies for rumination. So strategies for overthinking. And broadly speaking, those are something like mindfulness, which is structured, um, mental doing effectively or uh, engaging in uh, enjoyable and meaningful activity and what that means is between the time you wake up in the morning and time to, you go to bed what is it that you're doing with your time are you doing something that gives you a sense of meaning or purpose learning mastery enjoyment where you're caring or giving to others where you're solving problems something creative something that gives you a sense of accomplishment and reward. Um, it might be employment, but it might not be, uh, or something that gives you connection with other people or some kind of physical movement. Uh, and for a lot of us, uh, and I include myself in this, when, I'm, when I don't have structured time, so when I've taken holidays this year, for, or when I've taken annual leave this year, I haven't been able to go abroad, and I have often found my time really kind of squandered, and I've felt more stressed than usual. 
because I haven't paid attention to building these uh, things into my days. I haven't paid attention to habits and structure and routine. And I haven't paid attention to thinking about what are those things that when I do them, I get a sense of nourishment. I started to learn my lesson towards the end of last year. And I, I did a couple of courses online, uh, so free courses online that were things I was really interested in. Uh, I was doing them on Coursera. Um, so I learned about some scientific subjects that were unrelated to my work, but that I thought were really interesting. And that was a that was a, a, a real turning point uh, for the last year. Because when you go on holidays, you're fine because you're usually doing stuff and you know, it's in a, you're in a new environment. But if you're at home and you're not doing anything, uh, why would you feel good if you're not doing things that make you feel good? And I think that that is a good kind of rule of thumb to think in your, in your head. And actually, th this is the basis for one of the most effective treatments for depression, which is called behavioral activation treatment. Um, and again, it's based on this idea that if you're not doing things that make you feel good, why would you feel good? Uh, and it's essentially a kind of coaching uh, to start to incorporate uh, enjoyable and meaningful activities into your day-to-day -day life. And I've linked to a really excellent workbook from the university in the States uh, at the end of the presentation as well, which is a lovely explanation of the principles behind this, uh, why it works, uh, and some techniques for thinking about, uh, for, for, for starting to think about what you could do, uh, even if you're uh, stuck at home and isolating at the moment, to, uh, to start to build those things into your day-to-day. So that's meaningful activity. And those are the six pillars. Uh, people, I think that those are a useful mooring, again, for people to think if they're, if, they're, uh, if they're feeling stressed and overwhelmed, if they're having a tough time, these are useful just kind of um, touchstones to, to go back to. Um, and then those, those are the links. And I'm, uh, I'm happy, I'll, I'll, I'll send the presentation to Bob that, and he can distribute it to people if people are interested. Um, and that's it. So I'm very happy to take questions now, Bob, if you, yeah, I think you have some prepared from people. That's correct. And uh, thank you for that amazing presentation. It's, uh, and those links at the end, I'll certainly, if you send those to me, I'll make them available on our website of Catwill. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. One, the big question, I think you've touched on it, is one that a lot of our WM community revolves around anxiety. It's our illness is one, the illness we live with is one where it's kind of all about, or most of it is about blood results. So we have these three monthly blood tests. Um, every three months we go and see our consultant or talk to our consultants on the phone. And there's an awful lot of anxiety I've, I've picked up on the build up the week before those, uh, the blood test, going for the blood test. And then the, the, the few days before the talk, the dreaded talk with your consultant, have they gone yeah. down? or are they going up? And if they've gone up, does it mean I've now got to go and do chemotherapy or take some other drugs? It's that whole anxiety. And it's really some tips, really, how, how to, to deal with it. I think you've touched on it. And, and but anything else you can say on that? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And it is, um, it's something that has come up a lot over the past year. So uh, as you guys probably know, I used to work in the cancer center. Um, but, and, but my colleagues in the hospital are still working in the cancer center in Oxford. Uh, and, and a lot of those patients have been facing the same thing. So less frequent contact with their doctors, um, virtual appointments that can feel less satisfying um, and, and, a, and a whole host of other reasons that people are feeling more uh, out of, uh, uh, less in control of their health. Um, and I think loss of being, feeling out of control has been a really th real theme of the last year. Uh, for all of my patients, really. And people uh, have often ended up in hospital because the ways that they're trying to get back in control of how they're feeling are sometimes counterproductive. So people drinking more, for instance. So drawing back on the principles we talked about in the presentation, I guess that the, what I could say about that is that there are aspects of that that are outside of your control and there are aspects that are inside of your control. So, it may, I mean, it may be that there are things that you can do about it. So it may be that you can, uh, just off the top of my head, you can email your clinician, you could ask for sooner appointments, you could ask for more regular um, communication of results. Um, but a large portion of that are things that you can't do anything about. And I think recognizing that is not in our nature, actually, because we always want to fix the problem. Uh, and one of the ways that we try and fix a problem is we think, OK, so I know what I can do is I can think about this and that will give me a sense of control over it. And a lot of people with um, 
chronic anxiety or generalized anxiety uh, have developed this technique of worrying as a way to try and control the, the uncontrollable. Uh, and that's an important thing to spot in yourself, I think, because again, the tricky thing about it is that it does work initially, right? You think, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to think about all the different outcomes and scenarios that will come from the thing next week. And then at least I'll have them set up in my head and I'll have a sense of control over them. And that kind of works. You feel a bit better when you do that because you're, at least you're dealing with it. The, the problem comes when that becomes a, a habit uh, and becomes a kind of, uh, you get stuck in this thing of thinking about things in order to control them. It's one of the reasons people develop kind of long-standing generalized anxiety and so I think it's important to spot that that's you're doing that, that that's what you're doing and different things will will work for different people so it may be that writing so the the, the general principles are that doing is more helpful than thinking if it's something uncontrollable mm -hmm. so it may be that writing down your worries or writing down a list of questions for your uh, clinician when you see him or her or it may be that uh, you know, writing things down and then saying that's done. And now I can bring my attention over here to something that's uh, distracting or enjoyable or where I'm learning something or I'm, I'm solving a problem that I can solve. That could be a jigsaw puzzle or it could be helping someone repair their bike. Um, because you're, it's important to remember that your brain is designed to do stuff and work out problems that are workable, edible. It's not designed to... Uh, agitate and kind of chew over things that are outside of your control because that that's that internal source of stress that can make you really unwell so if, if you can think about those principles the uh, doing is better than thinking uh, and that doing might mean that you uh, that there's something you, you have control over that you can do something about it but it may mean that uh, you're just kind of chewing over problems that are outside your sphere of influence and that and that might be making you sick Thank you. Um, I, just from a personal experience, I'm, I'm an ex-serviceman and I, I, when I go for my um, meetings, I have what, I call, what we used to call actions on. So I have these two things in my head. What's my action going to be if my readings are good? Well, I know it's going to be more of the same. What's my action going to be if it's not so good news? Well, I've got to ask questions of my clinician and work out a strategy for how I'm going to move forward. So we're all different, um, but uh, for me is how I deal with it. Um, well, I think if I can just make a comment about that. So that, that's, that's a fantastic solution because it does two things. First of all, you realize that you can't make a decision now about because you don't know the outcome, but what you can do is you can make a plan for the outcome. So yeah. you are doing instead of thinking and the thinking that you're doing is specific problem solving in a, in a, uh, about something that you can do something about. So I think that perfectly uh, corresponds to those principles that we're thinking about. And that's a very nice example. You can say, I can do something about a plan, but I can't do anything about results because I won't know them for another week. No. Okay. And I've got a question that uh, was, it's kind of two questions in one about the cognitive behavior therapy. Is there evidence that cognitive behavior therapy is helpful for cancer patients, um, especially those with blood cancers? Uh, th yes, there is. There is evidence from from a number of different uh, randomized trials. The evidence from uh, so the, the the particular type of cognitive behavioral therapy that we use in the Oxford Cancer Center um, actually pulls out two different components of CBT. So one is the B, so that's behavioral activation that we talked about a bit in the presentation. Um, and the reason that we do that is there is evidence that just the behavioral part is as effective as the whole CBT package itself. Um, so for, for depression in particular, um, you, you don't have to think about thoughts and correcting thoughts and all those kind of stuff that some people don't find helpful. You can just think about the behavioral part and building in activities in people's days so that they're doing rather than thinking. Um, but yes, CBT uh, is, is effective for any kind of stress or distress or anxiety or, or mood problems. Um, and components of that, like behavioral activation, and I've linked to that presentation, uh, I've linked to that workbook from uh, from the states in the uh, in the uh, on the last slide of the presentation, um, but yeah, it's evident. It's it, it's it's got the best evidence really across a range of difficult uh, emotional and, uh, and and stressful experiences. Okay, and add on to that question from the same person is should should uh, 
should we be seen by a, a CBT therapist or um, we sh should it require a health professional like yourself, a health, you know, a health psychologist like yourself? So it, it, I th that really depends on the degree of the problem. So if you think about a stepped model of care, um, is, which sort of looks like a pyramid, where at the bottom is most people, uh, uh, most people who will be fine uh, after they get some kind of edu education about some principles like this presentation. The level above that is people who are struggling a bit more, a bit more distressed. They may need a, 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 a for instance, a CBT therapist from IAPT. So that's somebody with um, a shorter period of specific training in CBT. Uh, and then at a higher level, uh, with more severe problems, a person might need a, uh, a, cl a clinical psychologist, for instance, who has a much longer period of training, uh, a much broader um, range of psychotherapeutic, psychological strategies and, and principles that they can draw on. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, I think it depends on, the, on the, how much somebody is struggling and how severe their uh, symptoms are. Okay. Uh, and you, you touched on mindfulness and uh, I'm doing a little plug here is that uh, Kat and I are, are trying to set up a, a mindfulness stroke relaxation um, online uh, session, a few sessions with a, with a trained um, psychotherapist, uh, yeah, psychotherapist down in Bristol. Um, you recommend that to us as a group that uh, yeah. is something we should do? Yeah. Uh, if, if people are interested in mindfulness, I would suggest um, really uh, setting yourself a target of doing daily practice for a period of a few weeks um, mm. and that can be five minutes or it can be 15 minutes or it can be 40 minutes um, the reason I suggest that is because it is a skill that you need that you need to get better at um, it, it do, uh, telling someone to do one session of mindfulness is a bit like telling someone to pick up a violin and play the violin you know it's going to be it's going to feel pretty clumsy the first time um, but uh, over time when you start because you have to really feel the principles you know you, you can't teach someone to play tennis by talking to them about tennis so you have to you have to get out there with the tennis racket so to kind of to be in a mindfulness a guided mindfulness session and to start to understand the principles and start to feel you know emotions or thoughts arising uh, and learning how to deal with those in a way that tends to make you uh, feel better rather than worse um, does take time and does take practice but as I said before, it is a really, really useful tool in your toolbox um, if people can get involved in it. It's not the be all and end all, but it's but without mindfulness, it can be really difficult to um, to deal with stress and difficult emotions and difficult thoughts. Uh, yeah. a, a lot of people do kind of their own mindfulness, you know, so people who um, do jigsaws or work on their bike or um, knit, they're doing mindfulness because they're focusing on doing um, Mindfulness, guided mindfulness sessions are just a different way of thinking about it. Yeah, um, I, I I was very dubious about mindfulness myself, and and my uh, clinical nurse suggested that I went on a mindfulness course. And uh, I think I said this to people on Facebook recently. I turned up, there's me and eleven women, two female instructors, and I thought, what on earth are you doing here? But four weeks later, I, I, you know, absolutely loved it. And I really saw the benefit for, of it. It was just a really nice skill to learn and, and still do it now. It's something you, you can live with, isn't it? As you say, if you can do it two or three times a week, it's a really good uh, way of growing yeah. yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it, it, is, it is kind of a truism to say that men are, are different in how they deal with difficult emotions and how they deal with stress. Uh, and it may well be that, that you... you uh, the, the thing that you find most helpful isn't meditating it's you know doing something practical with your hands you know because yeah. that, that is that is a different way of being than sitting and thinking it's much more nourishing yeah. okay brilliant well ian um i'm sure there would be lots of questions but we just can't it's not feasible to get ask people for questions because there are so many of us and but i hope we've i think you've covered you know really well the whole concept of our mental health and how we should deal with the stresses of, uh, of having this chronic condition that we all live with uh, or live with people who live with it. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time this morning. Um, and everybody, make sure, I will make sure I, I post on, uh, on the website the links that Ian has suggested.